Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Northshire Presents. For those of you who don't know me, I am Rachel Person, the event manager for Northshire Bookstore in Saratoga Springs, New York. Here, as I so often am these days, with my friend and colleague, Davith Wood, event manager for Northshire Bookstore in Manchester, Vermont. Um, a couple of quick notes before we get started. First of all, you may have noticed as you came in that we are recording this evening's uh, presentation for future broadcasts on our YouTube channel. However, we have the settings arranged so that only those of us who are unmuted and speaking will be recorded. Um, so you can have your video on if you wish and you will not be recorded for posterity. Um, please use the chat throughout the evening to type in any questions that you have. We will have time for audience questions at the end of the night and David and I will save up your questions and pose them for you later on this evening. So make liberal use of that chat. Um, and then last of all, um, a note of thanks um, and a request for a favor. Um, the note of thanks is to thank you for your incredible support of Northshire and independent businesses and independent book selling through this past year and a half. Um, it's not an easy business and our continued survival is owed to the incredible loyalty and support of our customers. Um, and we're deeply grateful for that. And then the favor we have to ask is to ask you to once again, consider shopping as early as you can for the holiday season this year, if you're planning to buy books, um, the supply chain and publishing is very messed up right now. Um, we've had multiple books have their publication dates postponed and we've been told that certain titles, once they are sold out, they will be gone. Um, so if you can get a head start, if there are specific books you know you want, early in, or ordering them sooner rather than later will help us tremendously. Um, so those are the notes tonight. And now I get to turn things over to David to introduce our very special guest this evening. Thank you so much, Rachel. Well, I am delighted to welcome back to Northshire James Gus Speth for They Knew, the U.S. federal government's 50-year role in causing the climate crisis. We had the pleasure of hosting him for one of our earliest virtual events during the pandemic on Earth Day 2020 and in celebration of his poetry books from Shire's Press, but we have instead, and it's already tomorrow. Gus is a legendary environmentalist. He served as a member and chairman of the U.S. Council on Environmental Equality, during the Carter administration, and from 1993 to 1999 was administrator of the United Nations Development Program and served as chair of the UN Deve Development Group. He is the author of numerous books, including the award-winning American Crisis series. He's taught at Georgetown, at Yale, and at the Vermont Law School. He founded the World Resources Institute and co-founded the Natural Resources Defense Council. His new book, They Knew, uh, has been called Devastating, Enraging, and Indispensable by Naomi Klein, a searing indictment by Elizabeth Colbert, and wh while Bill McKibben said, with skill and dedication, Gus has, Spath has documented precisely what we knew and when we knew it. This book is a shocking reminder of the chances for action we've already missed and a spur to finally move with vigor the climate crisis demands. Uh, all the royalties for the sale of They Knew goes to our children's trust. We are very lucky to be joined tonight also by Christy Cooper, a PhD scientist, documentary filmmaker, and Emmy award-winning cinematographer. She's the director of Youth v. Gov, the acclaimed documentary about Juliana versus the United States, which just won the Grand Teton Award at the Jackson Wild Media Awards. Please join me in welcoming to North Shire Bookstore, Christy Cooper and James Gustav Sven. Uh, Gus, why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about how they knew came about? Well, it was an interesting story because the uh, lawsuit that was brought uh, by our Children's Trust on behalf of 21 young plaintiffs to force the federal government uh, into effective climate action, uh, they needed a, for that lawsuit a, a history of what the federal government had actually done during this period. And they knew I was in the Carter administration a long time ago. And they asked me if I would write up the Carter administration. And I said, sure. So I wrote a little history of the Carter administration based on all the documents I could locate. And they said, well, we really like this. Would you please do all the other administrations? <laughs> it's a true story. And so I undertook uh, to do the whole story uh, from LBJ through Trump. And uh, it was uh, uh, quite a, uh, an ordeal. And uh, I think it, uh, but um, and it's a very sad story when you get down to it, uh, but uh, there are sad stories that need to be told and sad stories that need to be understood and, and learned from. And, and I, I hope and I think that this is such a book. 
Uh, the book grew out of the large report that I did for our Children's Trust and the uh, well-known uh, Juliana against U.S. Uh, litigation. And, uh, and, and it's dedicated to the 21 uh, children, um, young people now, uh, who brought this lawsuit originally about hmm, six years ago, sad to say. Uh, so uh, the, the plaintiffs uh, and, and their lawyers are still in court uh, pushing hard for a good result. And one day uh, what I've written may be uh, you know, in the courtroom and I may be testifying on the basis of it uh, in a proceeding. Um, I just hope it comes to that. Uh, so that's a bit of the background. Uh, I think it's a, uh, it's a, an important story. Uh, it's, it's not a stand up and cheer story. It's a story to, I think, uh, make people, uh, uh, very concerned, uh, more alarmed than perhaps they are a spur to action and the information that you need to be effective because you can't know the future and what we need to do if we don't understand the past. So that's, uh, that's why I did it. That's why we moved it from uh, a, a document that was prepared initially for a court proceeding uh, into a book that MIT Press uh, has now published. And, and uh, some of this um, uh, uh, material uh, that's in the book uh, has also been covered uh, by um, uh, Christy Cooper in her wonderful film, Youth v. Gov. Uh, and uh, so I'm delighted that, that she's here to uh, to uh, ask me some questions. Yes, I'm ab I'm absolutely honored to to be on this panel with you. Um, I so much admire the work that you've done um, throughout your career, and also what you the you know the incredible evidence um, that you have brought to the Juliana case with the work that you've done on your expert report and and now with this amazing book we we had always talked about that if the case never was able to go to trial um that we were wanting to present all of this evidence in our film so that at least there would be some public forum and i'm so excited that you now have released this book because there's another platform where folks can know all of this history and can know what our government has known and the, the policies that they that they have enacted um, over the last six decades. Um, so guess we had about two years ago, we had a really fun um, adventure doing your interview for our film and had very in-depth conversation about your knowledge of the previous government administrations and their knowledge around greenhouse gases. Um, I was wondering if you could if you could kind of share with the um, the viewers tonight a little bit about you know your past and your experience with the Carter administration and the work that you were doing you know this is now um, fifty years ago um, the work that you were doing in the administration on trying to to sound the alarm bells. Well, I think thank you, uh, Christy, very much for the comments. I I think the reason that they you know, that the plaintiffs wanted me first to do the Carter administration uh, was because it was a, a very important juncture when the science really first moved into the politics and the policy uh, arena. And, uh, and it's impressive when you go back and look at it, how much uh, we knew, uh, let's pick a date, say 1980, uh, that long ago, how much we knew about the climate threat. Uh, there were memos and, and uh, papers going throughout the Carter administration at various times, statements by the president, big commitment on the part of Jimmy Carter to renewable energy and energy efficiency gains and, uh, and a national goal set for renewable energy of 20% uh, by 2000. Uh, it was an awakening to, to the climate issue and to the need to put the country on a different en energy path. I'm not saying the Carter administration was perfect, but we knew so much back then about the climate science that we were able, uh, as reported in the New York Times at the time, we were able to suggest a, uh, an upper bound for the buildup of greenhouse gases way back in 1980. And, um, we might have been a little generous by some of today's 
estimates of what we should be doing, uh, but we weren't far off. And, and it was important that we understood way back then that we need to get busy, needed to get busy putting a ceiling on the buildup of these gases international, uh, internationally, globally. And uh, well, of course, it didn't happen. Uh, after Carter, we had the Reagan administration, and I can talk about the history of the whole, you know, give you a, a nutshell of the whole picture uh, in pretty short order, I, I think. Uh, and I think it's helpful it, to, it to also, <laughs> yeah, I think it's also helpful if, you know, to, when you paint that that kind of broad picture to to highlight some of those tipping point moments or the, those those decision moments, I think, throughout the administrations that you shared with me and that, I, you know, I was able to pull out from your expert report is that during each administration, there were there really were pivotal moments in our history where we could have made different decisions. Well, if we continued to build, if we had continued to build on the start that Jimmy Carter made and, the, and gone down the track that, that he identified, uh, we could have largely dealt with uh, the climate issue from the U.S. point of view, anyhow, uh, by now. Uh, we could have had a smooth trajectory, uh, uh, built, you know, built the changes that we needed in, and uh, of course, that's not what happened, and we're faced now with a crisis uh, and the need for deep and drastic uh, reductions uh, in greenhouse gas emissions quickly. Uh, the, uh, so what the pattern that emerges uh, from looking back over all these administrations uh, is that you had a series of, of administrations, I would say three, that took the problem seriously, that knew they had to do something that knew that this was an issue and and and, in, and did different things uh, in these three administrations uh, to address the issue. Some uh, more far reaching than others, some more preliminary. In Carter's case, it was preliminary. We were just starting to work on the issue. Uh, but uh, the Clinton administration uh, understood very well what needed to be done. And the Obama administration understood well what needed to be done. Um, and uh, in the sense that they took it seriously, they moved beyond having available information to really internalizing it and saying, now we, we have to act. Each of those three, unfortunately, was followed by a flamethrower <laughs> administration, uh, which I document uh, in, in the book. Um, you know, Reagan came in after Carter and erased a lot of what he'd done, for example, on renewable energy, almost all of it. Um, George W. Bush uh, came in uh, after Clinton and, uh, and, and, and he was terrible on, on this, this issue. And, on, and, and, th and then thirdly, uh, Trump, of course, came in after Obama and, and systematically went after attacking everything that Obama had tried to do on this issue. So no administration really, until we get to Biden, had made a commitment to sharp reductions uh, in emissions. But at least three of them had understood that they had to do something and were moving. Uh, none of them were very good. Uh, some were better than others. And if you pardon getting a little bit political, uh, it just happens that the ones that were least seized with the need to do something were the Democratic administrations and they were followed by uh, Republican administrations. I hate to put it that way, but that's the reality and we may as well understand it and face it. Um, because you know now a lot of the Republican party is still not uh, appreciating, uh, to say the least, the seriousness uh, of this issue. Can you share with our, with our guests tonight a little bit um, how we got into this predicament with the the, our government being in bed with the fossil fuel industry. Where, where in our history did this strong collaboration and partnership between these two entities begin? And, and why is that, why has that really messed things up? Well, there has been historically a tremendous amount of, of money uh, to be made. And uh, I think any time uh, in, in our society as it is currently set up, uh, you, you create such an opportunity for wealth accumulation and, uh, and, and capital accumulation, uh, you're going to find it inhabiting democracy. 
And uh, that is clearly what has uh, happened here. Uh, and it persists uh, to this day uh, because uh, at this very minute, uh, the elements, almost all of the fossil fuel industry in various in its various components from pipelines to uh, oil and gas and coal and uh, you know they're fighting like crazy right now to try to be sure that uh, they don't have to do very much in response to uh, what the president is trying to do. And, and uh, it's a quiet battle going on within the framework of this, you know the reconciliation package and and other places. Uh, in our current politics, but it is, it's just, I think the opposition to doing anything responsible has been three sources. Uh, one has been the tremendous political clout and drive to, uh, you know, maximize its profits out of the fossil fuel industry and various components of it. And this is huge. This is just a fact of our political life where so much depends on money and financial contributions and promises to leave jobs in certain places and remove them if necessary from other places and and the politicians are scared and, and it's a sad sad situation the second factor has been that if once you realize that you've got to do something about the climate issue uh, then you really have to recognize the importance of strong federal action of strong government action and in this atmosphere that reagan started where government is cast as the enemy uh, then, um, you know, there, there's a tremendous ideological uh, uh, backlash against uh, anything the federal government would, you know, tries to do that's important and that is views as uh, interference in the economy. Uh, and that's been very big and it continues today. Um, and um, thirdly, um, you know, our, our system of political economy is really hooked on growth. And, and it, 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 it is a reality right now that, that growth is really hooked on fossil fuels. And it doesn't mean that we can't dramatically change that situation, but uh, that is the situation uh, right now. We're still 80% dependent on fossil fuels. Now we need to get to zero by 2050 at the latest, but, uh, but those are the factors that I think we're up against. And uh, that, that is the backdrop in a way to the book, because in the book, what we see is that no administration, Republican or Democrat, uh, has really committed to a dramatic reduction or even a long-term reduction in fossil fuel use. Even Obama, who did some good things for climate, uh, was very proud of having promoted fracking and having uh, promoted exports of U.S. fossil fuels. Making us the largest oil and gas producer in the world. There we are. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, um, you know, it, 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 uh, it, there's, a, there's a, a pattern here where you learn certain lessons, I think, from looking at this pattern that I report in the book. And, and one of those conclusions is, well, we really uh, certainly cannot depend uh, on the federal government. Uh, we can't depend on good science. Uh, we've had a, a lot of that and we needed it and it's been very important and will be in the future. Uh, we can't uh, depend on what I would call comfortable advocacy. Uh, my life has been one, I think, of comfortable advocacy and perhaps many of the listeners here have been engaged uh, in that. Uh, We've got to get beyond that, uh, and um, and I think the um, so in in my view, you know, several things are necessary to get us out of this situation we're in. We know we can't count on our political parties. Uh, there's a lot of lessons we've learned from the book about what doesn't work, and I just listed some. Uh, so what what do we do? Well, I think we. You know, we need a massive civil mobilization in the country. We need to get beyond comfortable advocacy to more demanding advocacy, more consistent advocacy, not one big march in New York that many of us participated in, but something every day uh, in the face of our political leaders. Some of it funny, I hope, or humorous, uh, some of it dead serious, all of it nonviolent, 
but we need to be out there in the streets and elsewhere in the offices, uh, sitting in whatever you want to do, but we need to be every day into this. Secondly, uh, we need judicial intervention. Okay. Uh, we need a constitutional protection and that's what's being sought in the Juliana case. But just remember this, unless there is a constitutional protection, unless the courts are enforcing it, then any administration, no matter how good, can be flipped in the next election. And, and we'll be back, we'll see the pattern that we've seen in the past repeat itself yet again. And we can't allow that to happen. So I think the courts are important. The executive branch has failed us. The legislative branch has failed us. Now we need the judicial branch to step up to the plate. And that's happened in some countries abroad. And uh, we need it to, to happen here. And the third thing I would just say is that one thing, one lesson that comes out of all this to me is that um, the, the system that we're living in, uh, based on consumerism, growth, uh, corporate power, uh, GDP measurement, uh, and vast inequalities in the society, a lot of uh, scared people, a lot of people at the margin. Uh, uh, this is a system that's not going to do the things that we need to do to deal with the climate issue over time. So we need to walk on two legs, I think. One is to, to uh, do what we can do now. And the immediate thing here, I think, is to, in, in part, is to be damn sure that everything that, uh, that, that, that Biden and, and Bernie and others want to get done, get done. Uh, and, uh, but then we also need some deep changes. So uh, we need a, a, a constitutional change uh, and, uh, and we need to start moving on the other foot, which is to introduce changes uh, in, the, in the political economy that will make dealing with these types of issues uh, uh, more straightforward and not the most difficult things in the world. Yeah, I really appreciate you sharing the, you know, the lessons learned, like how do we take this whole history, you know, which you, which you called in my film, the greatest dereliction of civic responsibility in history. How do we take, how do we take, you know, what, what our past is and, and move forward with it. And I, I really appreciate that. I wonder if we should share a little bit with the, um, with our guest tonight. Um, you know, I, I, let's let's focus a little bit on the judicial system and why these kids are taking this to the courts rather than marching in the streets and going to their politicians and and that was the whole premise of your original work um on creating this scientific re or this uh, expert report and which has eventually led to your book right um i think it's uh, it's really great for the audience members to know, and not everybody knows this, that in order to have a constitutional claim, you can't have a claim based on inaction. And so many folks, when they talk about what the government has done or why we're in this position, it's because people say, well, the government hasn't done anything. There's climate inaction. And I think what your work um, is, shows so well is that this is not about government inaction. It's about willful and affirmative action that the government has taken to lock us into a fossil fuel based energy system that's now violating these young people's constitutional rights to life, liber liberty, property, personal security. And I think that's a really important point for, for folks to understand that a consti constitutional claim is based on action that's harming these young people. And I'm wondering if you can, if you can just expand a little bit more on, you know, your experience and your knowledge of you know, this action versus inaction. Right. Well, you're absolutely right. People say, well, the government didn't, didn't act. Well, they did act. Uh, they, they have uh, leased uh, a tremendous portion of our current even uh, fossil fuel use is, is from federal resources. Uh, they've permitted, uh, they've researched, uh, they've advocated. Uh, the federal government has been the single biggest player in uh, in creating this uh, U.S. fossil fuel economy, and it's precisely uh, you know because the federal government has actively and knowingly, knowingly this is important, actively and knowingly 
endangered. The prospects of future generations and, and current generation of, of young people, like the plaintiffs in the case, uh, is, is, that, is that action that is creating the constitutional claim. Uh, you know, the Constitution doesn't protect everybody all the time against all kinds of injuries and, and problems. But if the federal government is creating an endangerment uh, knowingly, and, it, and it's a huge thing, then it rises to a constitutional claim. And that's what the plaintiffs are asserting here. And as I mentioned a moment ago, it's important, not more, not merely for right now, but it's important because that constitutional requirement can guide us into the future administration after administration, regardless of who comes into power. Yeah, absolutely. Was, was there, do you feel like there was, you know, one single moment when you were doing all of your research and compiling all of this information together. And, you know, I, I remember pouring over your scientific report, or it's not your scientific report, your expert report um, at the time when we were, were researching for our film and, and doing development. I spent um, one and a half years digging into to all of this history that, that you had put together. And, um, and I think you remember our, the interview that we did for the film. I think you said it was the most extensive um, and researched interview that you'd ever ever gone through, which was um, fun for us, but exhausting Ooh. for you. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you're, you know, this is, this is so much information in your book. And um, I, I'm just wondering if you feel like there's a single moment that kind of blew you away when you were putting all of this together. Well, I think, I mean, first, I want to just acknowledge our children's trust, a very powerful advocacy for children that is behind this litigation. And, and they had accumulated a vast amount of documentary research when I came onto the scene. And I couldn't have done this book uh, without the, the tremendous amount of documentary research that they had accumulated. They had been to all the presidential libraries and other things and really done a great job of pulling the available information uh, together. Uh, so I give them a lot of credit. I think one thing this exhaustive kind of treatment uh, of the situation uh, leads to, you know, is, is a, um, a realization that uh, there's really no room at all for uh, climate denial or rejection of the science. I mean, I've lo I looked at what each administration knew about the climate science, you know, from LBJ all the way, you know, through through Trump. And there's, it's a consistent story. I mean, the basics of the climate science picture have not changed. It's been validated over and over again. If the opposite had happened, uh, where the science got uh, all, you know, was proven wrong or projections were shown to be ridiculous and other things, but that's not what happened. The early projections are coming true. And, uh, you know, so it, it's, there's, it's, the real hoax is, you know, is climate denial, it is climate doubt about, about the science. Um, and uh, so, you know, you ask about a specific moment. Well, I think one moment that was very telling is that we, perhaps in our naivete, thought that uh, when, when the greenhouse of effect was finally detected, when the issue moved from being sort of the greenhouse theory to the greenhouse fact, that that would really motivate uh, the, the government to respond. That, that, you know, we, they could, people could always say, well, it's just a theory, it's just a theory. But uh, if it actually became documented that things were changing as a result of human activities and putting these greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, well, that would really change things. So we thought that. I would say we thought that for maybe 15 years. Uh, but, uh, you know, along comes Jim, Jim Hansen. And I, you know, I dwell on this in, in the book and testifies before Congress uh, with other uh, great scientists uh, like George Woodwell um, in the mid 80s. Uh, and, and they point out that uh, lo and behold, uh, we are seeing uh, the signal 
of climate change in the noise of the weather patterns. And, uh, and, and so that, you know, well, we thought, well, maybe something's really going to happen now. Well, I, you know, you know, the story that was mid 1980. And, uh, and now we're, we're, you know, 30, 40 years later. <laughs> what? And, and we were still uh, dealing with a bunch of nonsense uh, about whether it's really, uh, you know, the science is real and the president of the United States called him things, things he thinks it may be a hoax. And, uh, oh, Lord, uh, we, we, we really have got to take it with the utmost serious now, seriousness now and, and, uh, and, and bring some new tools uh, in, into the picture, as I mentioned earlier. So when, when Julia first approached you um, to work on this expert report for the case, what, what you know, you mentioned earlier that, that maybe in other points in your career, other points in, in the past that, um, you know, that you are now taking a different um, mode of advocacy or you're, you're, you know, you're definitely feeling the urgency around this. Can, can you talk about why you decided to take on this daunting task to be an expert um, for this case? Well, it, you know, it's hard to imagine, uh, you know, any issue more important. Uh, and uh, and I, as I, uh, you know, you mentioned earlier that I, one thing I, I've said in a number of contexts, uh, including the, the book, uh, is that, um, you know, this is, uh, in my view, the greatest dereliction of civic responsibility in the history of the Republic. You may have your own issue that you think is more important or as important, but this to me is the most important. I can't imagine anything more critical to the future of, of my grandchildren, to, to put it personally, uh, than, than getting a, a handle on, on this issue before it really uh, rumbles out of control, and and that was when we start giving the, getting these positive feedbacks where the climate change creates more climate change, and and that's beginning, and 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 so the the the, the urgency uh, is now, uh, and um, and 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 we need to take uh, a different tack, and uh, you know I've f worked on this issue, uh, you know now since. Uh, 1979, actually, and uh, and it's uh, it's it, it's it, it, what I've been doing, and 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 my colleagues indeed have been doing, uh, has not been notably uh, successful, uh, and I, I think the, uh, the 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 situation in the real impacts in the real world are driving change. Uh, the media has finally moved around. And is acknowledging that some of the horrific events that are occurring uh, in the real world in our country, in terms of drought and and and, and floods and, and storms uh, and fires, uh, is they are linked to, to climate change. And uh, so the media has come around and started being helpful. Uh, nature is is giving us some big warning signs itself, uh, and the politicians have picked up on it. Uh, and, uh, you know, that combination, uh, is, is, is helpful, but if it's, if those factors are going to be, uh, really impactful at the level we need, we're going to have to push ourselves, uh, into uncomfortable positions of, of advocacy and demands and giving money and other things, uh, and support for organizations that are carrying this fight. Uh, we've got to have a, a huge civic mobilization in the country uh, to deal with it. And we need this judicial intervention that we've been talking about off and on in this conversation. Uh, the courts can be an immense help. They have been in Europe, uh, in several countries. And, uh, and, and we need the judiciary, and particularly we need a, a constitutional interpretation that, that gives young people uh, protection. Yeah, and part of the the mobilization, I guess that you know that that I was interested in 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 helping out with was to create this this documentary about the case. Um, should we share a little a little trailer of the film so folks can can meet some of these plaintiffs and see a little bit more what this case is about? Please do. Okay, hold on, everybody, just a second. Go justice, go peace, go justice, go peace. 
Like youth who have come before us in the civil rights movement and other social justice movements, it is often the young among us that shine the light on systems of injustice. For a lot of young people right now, life is really scary. Hurricane Matthew hit head on. It is just so terrifying. If this drought gets any worse, our way of life will dissolve. Just as my family's farm is threatened by climate change, so too are the very stability and vitality of our country. The government is taking actions that are directly contributing to the destruction of our planet. We have evidence going back to the 50s that government and the fossil fuel industry knew that if they continued to burn fossil fuels, that it would cause catastrophic impacts. That's when they started editing climate reports. It's all because of choices that we had no participation in. And I'm scared for my future. It's the greatest dereliction of civic responsibility in the history of the Republic. 21 young people ages 11 to 22 are suing the federal government over policies they say are destroying their world. We are not willing to wait around for someone else's timeline to dictate the trajectory of our lives. I look forward to standing in court with all my fellow plaintiffs. I love you all. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth? I do. Whether we win the lawsuit or not, we are already making ripples in the world to show real change can come from young people standing up for what they believe in. All right. Of all the cases working their way through the federal court system, none is more interesting or potentially more life-changing than Juliana versus the United States. So hopefully that gives folks a, um, yeah, just kind of a little bit more of a taste of what this case is all about that you have provided so much guidance on. And, um, yeah, I, I just, I think that I, I feel so privileged that I was able to use so much of your material and your research and um, your participation in this film is that I think the, the historical aspect that we were able to weave into the story is so critical, I think, for the understanding of what, how we move forward. Well, thank you, but I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, not, uh, not nearly, nearly as important in this uh, story as, uh, as the plaintiffs and, and their attorneys, uh, Julia Olson and Phil Gregory. Uh, and, um, but um, the film was great. Uh, I've seen the whole thing uh, and, and, uh, and the, 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 the trailer was very moving. And, and tell us again about this award you just won. <laughs> yeah, I was just in uh, the Jackson Wild Media Awards last week. It's kind of, it's, it's considered nature's, um, nature films oscars um event and we won the grand teton award which is the best of festival so we were we were incredibly incredibly honored it's it's you know the somebody's asking what's the name of the film it's called youth v gov um and you know we're, we're mostly honored that this film is receiving recognition because we really believe that what's really touching people like you said is is you know the the heart of the story is the plaintiffs and it's their their personal impact stories and their journey through this, you know, historical case, this historical and landmark case. Um, so it's been my my honor and privilege to to work with you, Gus, and and helping to create that that small snippet, um, what, which I think is a really important snippet in understanding how we got here and, and how we move forward. Amen. Do you have? <laughs> Do you have any any um, final lessons and big take home messages that you would like to leave with leave with our guests before we open it up for questions? Or is there, you know, what would you most um, your biggest heart's desire to happen with this book? Well, I think the book uh, is is an education for people who need uh, who want to know and need to know the history of how we got to where we are. We're not going to find the right path forward until we understand how we got where we are. And uh, the book is a serious uh, 
and uh, and 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 you know reliable. I I, I insist a reliable uh, depiction of what each administration uh, knew about the climate science, what they knew about alternative paths to get onto, and what they actually did, and what they all did in the end was to continue to sustain and promote the fossil fuel economy. And we need a dramatic break with that pattern of 50 years. Mm. And I think the book uh, will, uh, you know, does underscore that and, and point to uh, these lessons that I've mentioned earlier as, uh, and uh, it's a cautionary tale because it says, that, you know, we, we need to understand how difficult this has been in the past if we're going to do enough uh, today politically. And, and I, I guess I have one more question before I hand it hand it back to, to Rachel is um, how feasible is it for us to, 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 to get off of fossil fuels? Well, it's been feasible to get off of fossil fuels, uh, you know, for over 40 years. You just have to start. Now we have a bigger challenge than we did if we'd started 40 years ago with the transition. Uh, that, but, um, you know, we know a lot about what to do. The prices of, uh, re of renewable energy uh, sources are way down. Um, and, um, you know, we can build the right kind of grids to, and other, and we need to, you know, so there's a lot that needs to be done in the kind of mega way. Uh, of national policy, uh, big picture directions of renewables and efficiency gains, and uh, and and dealing with the the agricultural emissions and other things. We're but there's also a lot you know that we still should do uh, individually and in our communities. Uh, so we need every community to declare a climate emergency. Uh, we need every community to to start getting uh, quickly uh, to net zero emissions. Uh, we need a state policy in Vermont, uh, for example, uh, to make this Global Warming Solutions Act really work and work quickly and work deeply and well. Uh, and there's a process right now to have an impact on that, uh, on the state law. So at all levels from, you know, sort of international affairs, which John Kerry is going to uh, lead at the new upcoming uh, COP20 Conference of the Parties 26 in Glasgow later this month. Uh, you know, we have to push at that level. We have to push at the national level, state level, local level. It, it, it can be done, but it won't be done unless we all become, you know, really in a way hyper hyperactive on the subject. Yeah, I agree. We need, we need every community across the country holding their government, governments accountable. Thank you both so much, Gus and Christy. This is fascinating. And please type any questions you have in the chat if you have any more. We've already got a few. This first one's from Sue. She says, how can the young people advocate activism for their peers? There are extraordinary young people leading the way, but many are focused on their own lives and feel powerless. Do you want me to take that, Gus? Yeah, please, yeah. That'd be sure. Great. Um, you know, we, uh, uh, yes, a, a lot of the, the young people are fe feeling very, very powerless right now during, during this time. And I think one of the things that we're trying to do with our impact team with campaign with this film is first, the first step is awareness and outreach, right? You, we, we really need to shift the conversation, I think, on the climate crisis, that this is no longer about personal responsibility. It's not about, um, recycling and riding your bike and, you know, being vegetarian. Those things are all great. We should all be striving to do those things within our own lives because it probably will just make your life better. But but the, the real action that we need is systemic change. And that will only happen if we are holding our governments accountable. And so it's, I think for young people, I think it's so important for them to understand this history of what, what Gus depicts in his book. It's so in, important for them to understand how our government functions, how our court system works, what their constitutional rights are. And I think once they, they have these tools in place, they have the language and they have the vernacular to go out and fight for, for, to, for their rights to be protected. 
Um, so I, I strongly believe I have a 20 year old daughter and I have been, you know, teaching her for the last 10 years about her rights and encouraging her to, to stand up for those and to, and to understand what they are and to, to try to, you know, come into the movement and, and into these actions kind of with that as a basis. You know, there are now a proliferation of organizations for, uh, you know, young people to participate and, and, uh, you know, they, they range from national groups uh, uh, like the Sunrise Movement to others. But in a way, the, the young people are carrying this issue today more than any other, other group. And uh, that's so encouraging and, and so vital. Uh, and, you know, I don't want to exaggerate, but I think it, in a way, it all began um, with, um, with this lawsuit. I mean, these, um, this, this effort with the with young people bringing this lawsuit six years ago uh, really paved the way to uh, the youth movement that we have today. I'd never distract from anybody else who participated. And of course, Greta has had a huge role in, in focusing things. But, uh, but, but the uh, Juliana plaintiffs and the Juliana litigation was a, uh, was a pioneering effort that opened opened up uh, this this issue to, to young people. So Bonnie asked the question, um, wasn't this case dismissed? And what, so really just sort of generally what's going on with the Juliana case right now? Where, where is it? Yeah, well, it's, uh, you know, the federal government, uh, uh, Republicans and Democrats have uh, pulled out all the stops to oppose these young people getting into court. And I really am disappointed that the Biden administration has uh, persisted with that pattern. And I hope that as the, you know, new uh, administration gets control of the Justice Department, that that will change. Uh, right now, uh, it's very much before the district court judge again. Uh, as it has been uh, several times, and uh, she uh, is being asked to uh, amend the, the complaint to deal with some of the issues that uh, came up in the earlier litigation and to allow this to move forward judicially. So, you know, we expect a decision. I think the plaintiffs expect a decision, uh, you know, any week. Any day. <laughs> any day. <laughs> and, uh, but it's still it's still going forward, and there's still hope, and there's still fight, uh, and um, and I think the uh, uh, you know so we'll we'll have to hope for the best there. We, it's mm -hmm. not something that you know it, it's been what's been said has been said, and it's now before the court, as as we say. Yeah, and I would just add to that um, that the where where the case kind of got hung up was with the last Ninth Circuit Court decision. Um, where the the three judges in the Ninth Circuit Court um, they got they got really hung up on the injunctive relief that the plaintiffs were seeking, which was basically asking the courts to mandate that the government implement climate recovery plans. And this the the motion that that Gus is is referring to right now is asking for asking the courts permission to amend their complaint to put the focus on declaratory relief. And declaratory relief is really important. Um, in the in the court of law, this is this was the foundation of Brown v Brown versus Board of Education in 1954 with the very first Supreme Court um, decision. It was based on declaratory relief, simply stating that these young people's constitutional rights were being violated by the government. They had a constitutional right, and that it was being violated. It wasn't until the following year that desegregation actually happened and that the courts um, mandated desegregation in the schools. And so very similar to that, the Juliana plaintiffs are asking for this declaratory relief and for the focus to be on that. And as, as Gus said, we're, we're very hopeful that Judge Aiken is going to allow them to mend their complaint, which would put it back on track for trial again. So it's in the district courts at the moment. Christy. Uh, there's a question here for, uh, from Elizabeth. She says, Gus, you alluded to the need for action by the masses. It's worked in the past by putting pressure on Washington. Greta tried, as have others, to nurse a mass response, but it hasn't taken off as much as it needs. 
What's the answer? More climate marches or something more radical? Constitutional climate change lawsuits. Well, that would be a big breakthrough, <laughs> let me tell you. And and that's what we're hoping for is, is a, a new pattern of judicial action that can uh, move things along. Uh, I think, as I said earlier, um, I think the advocacy of, of the past has been in some ways pretty laid back uh, for, for the most part, not always. But when Sunrise sat in on, you know, Nancy Pelosi's office and uh, started insisting on attention. And, uh, and, and when their enthusiasm was picked up by the Green New Deal advocates uh, in the Congress, uh, you know, this is very important. And, and, and I think the, the type of, uh, of activism that, um, uh, you know, that uh, young people uh, you know, from Greta <laughs> on out uh, have, have brought to this uh, needs to be expanded upon. We have a pattern of letting up. Uh, you know, we had this huge and very impressive and successful in many ways, a march on, on the climate issue uh, in New York City. Uh, busloads of people went from various places in Vermont uh, down there. It was, it was huge, uh, but it wasn't really followed up, was it? I mean, there, there needs to be uh, that kind of uh, sustained uh, action, you know, because it's really... You know, we're we're up against uh, 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 the need for uh, action if we're going to save the world for for our children and grandchildren. I mean, it's that serious. Uh, things are going badly wrong. I mean, I don't want to go through all the climate uh, projections, but um, <clears throat> but if we 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 don't have any time left now, and and that should spur people to a different type of uh, of, of insisting. And, and we cannot have, uh, you know, our politicians um, uh, on the fence anymore or worrying about their contributions from the fossil fuel industry. Uh, you know, we need to elect good people who are going to carry this fight. And, and so this 1920, you know, 2022 election uh, is going to be vital. I mean, think of how close this issue is in the Congress now. Uh, we, we are hanging by a thread, literally, and uh, you know, and under that is the abyss. Yeah, and I would just add to to Gus's response that um, in June, Judge Aiken ordered the Biden administration to begin confidential settlement discussions with the plaintiffs, and um, so I think the more you know, the more pressure that we can put on the Biden administration in whatever form we can to take a different stance on this case and to allow these plaintiffs to go to trial, um, to have their day in court and or to settle the case. As I guess mentioned much earlier in the conversation, a court supported resolution would provide long lasting, a long lasting climate policy that subsequent administrations could not overturn through executive actions and um, legislative actions. So we have this huge opportunity right now to put a lot of pressure on the Biden administration um, you know, to seize this opportunity. I mean, in Vermont, are the is our delegation? Uh, you know, Bernie ha has been wonderful. Uh, have our other two representatives in Washington been wonderful on this? Um, you know, what is our state going to do? Has our governor been wonderful? You know, I don't think these people are seized with this issue at the level that they need to be. Only Bernie. Very true. Gus, Christy, thank you both so much. That's an important note to end on. Um, we appreciate you both coming in to join us uh, so much this evening. The book is They Knew, the U.S. Federal Government's 50-Year Role in Causing the Climate Crisis. You can order it at the link in the chat from Northshire.com. Um, thank you both so much, and I, I can't wait to, to watch your documentary, Christy. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much for having us. Thanks, Gus. Well, thank all of you for, for hosting this. I really appreciate it. Thank you all. And we'll see you at a new, another Northshire Presents virtual event soon. And take good care. Thank you. Thank you and good night. Good night.